So we've been covering vapor compression, refrigeration. We've talked about the refrigerant lines running to and from the house, from the condensing unit to the furnace on the inside. And one of those lines is called the suction line. One of those lines is called the liquid line. So I'd like to ask you the question, which of those lines is hot to the touch? Which of those lines is cool to the touch? The suction line is hot, the suction line is cold, the liquid line's hot, the liquid line's cold. And then which line is typically insulated and which line is typically not insulated? So in the suction line, which way does the flow go in each of those, in the suction line and liquid line? I'm going to pause. I don't want you to shout it out. I want you to write it all down, okay? And I'm going to come around and check. What's happening in the suction line? What's traveling in it? Vapor. Where is it going from? Evaporator. Where is it going to? What's in the liquid line? Liquid. <laughs> that was easier. Where is it going from? Where it was generated. It was generated. It came out of the condenser. Where does it go to? It goes up to the expansion valve evaporator. So that's clearing up like what, what, what's, what's in the line, where is it going from and to. It just came out of the condenser. This has to draw in air on a hot August day and reject heat to that air. You know it takes in 100 and maybe a 10 degree F air and it throws out 115 degree F air or 120 degree F air, right? Purpose is really not to heat up the air on the outside of the house, but you got to dump the heat somewhere. So if it's rejecting heat to 110 degree air, what's the temperature of the refrigerant coming out of the condenser? It's hot. Is the liquid hot? It sure is. Up here, you have air coming in, going over the filter, goes over to A-coil, the evaporator coil. Maybe it comes in 75 degrees F. Maybe it comes out 55 degrees F. So nice 55 degree F air is blown over all the occupants in your house, in your bedroom. It feels great, right? The refrigerant in the evaporator is boiling. The refrigerant in the evaporator is evaporating. The refrigerant in the evaporator is lower temperature than 50 degrees or 55 degrees or whatever, right? So what's the temperature of the vapor coming out? It's cool. Maybe it's 40 degrees, right? Vapors right after it boiled. It's cold. What? Vapor right after it's boiled is cold. That's the way refrigeration works. So which line is hot? The liquid line. Which line is cold? The suction line. Now, one of those lines is insulated because you don't want it to transfer heat with the environment. Okay. So either the suction line, which is cold, is going to absorb some heat. And if you insulated it, it would reduce how much heat was absorbed. Or the liquid line is going to be hot. It's going to reject some heat as it travels. And you want to insulate it so it stays nice and hot as it gets up into the evaporator coil. Which one do you want? Would you really like to have hot, hot liquid up to the evaporator coil or nice, cool vapor down to the compressor? Which one? Which one? So which one do you want to insulate? Do you want to insulate the suction line or the liquid line? It sounded like the, the consensus was we'd like to insulate the suction line and leave uninsulated the liquid line. If you have some subcooled liquid going up to the evaporator, even better than saturated liquid. So what you're going to do is you're going to have some subcooling of the liquid if there's stray heat transfer. Which line is larger diameter? The suction line? Is that the large diameter? And then you strap on insulation around it? It's like huge. 
you can get a, a chunk of insulation that's three, four inches in diameter around that suction line compared to a pencil thin a liquid line that's uninsulated. So one's huge with its insulation, one's tiny. But that's, that's life, that's the way it is. So here's a problem. So we have refrigerant 134A is the working fluid in a vapor compression refrigeration cycle with two evaporators, evaporator number one and evaporator number two. Saturated liquid exits the condenser at 36 degrees. So if it exits at 36 degrees, you can look up the saturation pressure and you find that the pressure in the condenser 911 kilopascal 9 bar then you go through an expansion valve and the refrigerant in the evaporators are negative 4 and negative 26 so is this first evaporator is this the one that's negative 4 or is it negative 26 degrees C and likewise is then the second evaporator, is that the negative 4 or the negative 26 degrees C? It just says, you know, the evaporators are negative 4 and negative 26. Which one's colder? Evaporator 1 or evaporator 2? And why? Why? Because you can tell from the pressures. Which one's at a lower pressure? Which one's at the lowest pressure of all of it? Number two, because you have one restriction, then another restriction to get to it. So you have a pressure drop and then another pressure drop. So this one's actually at negative four degrees C. And when you look up, you find the saturation pressure at negative four degrees C to be about 253 kilopascal per refrigerant 134A. And the second evaporator is at negative 26 degrees C. Hence the pressure is 101 or 102 kilopascals, slightly over atmospheric pressure. All right. Saturated vapor exits each evaporator. So right here it's saturated vapor at 7 and saturated vapor at 6. The next part of the question reads, the first evaporator has a refrigerating capacity of 1.3 tons. So they're telling you that Q dot into the first evaporator is 1.3 refrigerant tons or tons of refrigerant or just TONS. And then you have to recall one ton of refrigeration is equal to 211 kilojoules per minute or 200 BTUs per minute or different but that's one conversion factor that'll work 211 kilojoules per minute all right makes sense and then the second one the q dot 2 is equal to 0 0.9 tons so you can turn that into kilowatts if you like this turns out to be uh, 4.572 kilowatts and the next one turns out to be 3.165 kilowatts. Question, determine the mass flow rate of the refrigerant through each evaporator. So what is the mass flow rate through the first evaporator? What's the mass flow rate through the second evaporator? And what units? Kilograms per second. Next, what is the net power input to the cycle? That would be W dot to drive the compressor right up here. The net power, if there's only one power in, there's no, no turbines to help produce any power to reduce the consumption. So it, what it, whatever the compressor takes in is, is the net power in. All right. Okay. How do we solve for part A? Energy balance around the first evaporator. If you look at the first evaporator, you find that Q dot 1 is equal to the M dot 1, what we're looking to solve for, times H7 minus H4. And you have to get to H7 and H4. H7 is H of G at the negative 4 degrees C. And what's about H of 4? It's equal to H3, which is H of... 
F at the 36 degrees C. True? Only one unknown in the equation, M dot 1. Same equation for M Q dot 2 is equal to M dot 2 H6 minus H5. And what about H5? Same as H3 is equal to, well, it's the same as H4, I should say, which is equal to H3, right? Add saturated. Okay, what about the net power into? Do a first law around the compressor. W dot into the compressor is the mass flow rate 1 plus mass flow rate 2, the total mass flow rate going through the compressor, times H2 minus H1. Okay, how do I get H1? H1. How do you get H1? Yeah, sometimes they'll put a little mix box right here, M-I-X. Sometimes they just show them joining up. Guess what? When they join up, they have to mix, right? And so you have to do an energy balance right around this junction. If you do an energy balance around that junction, you get that M dot 1, bringing with it H8, plus M dot two, which goes through a second evaporator, bringing with it H6 is equal to M dot one plus M dot two times H1. That's H1 right there, right? Did you like that equation? Any questions about it? So I know the mass flow rates. I know the H's, H6 and H8, and hence I can calculate H1. That's how you get it. How do I get S1? Yeah, well, okay. I'm going to do this. I want you to struggle a little bit to get S1, okay? You tell me how. I'm going to pause. I want you to tell me how you're going to get S1. So we know that the pressure at 1 is equal to the pressure at 6 is equal to the pressure at 8. All of it's 101 kPa or thereabouts, right? Guess what? You just calculated H1 and you know P1. What's that state principle? Two independent intensive properties. Looks like pressure and enthalpy are those. And that's in principle how you calculate. Get entropy as a functional refrigerant 134A knowing the enthalpy at that state, which is the, equal to the value that you can calculate, and the pressure equal to 101 kPa or thereabouts. Knowing pressure and enthalpy, theoretically, you can get S. Now, in your tables, doing it by hand, you may have a double interpolation, which you don't like. But in Excel software, it's an easy little call. That's all it is, okay? Make sense? Once you have this S, then you get H2S, such that H2S is equal to the enthalpy refrigerant 134A. Entropy is equal to S1. And the pressure is equal to 911 kPa. True? You just you know how to analyze compressors and you've done it before. So that's how you would get the H2. H2 is equal to H2S because there's no isentropic efficiency for that compressor. You assume it's 100% isentropic efficiency. And there you go. That's how you calculate the answer for parts. I put it into Excel so you can reproduce this one. Take a look at the pressures. There's the lowest of the low pressures at state 1. 5, 6, and 8. 1, 5, 6, and 8. All have the low pressure, right? And then the intermediate pressure of 253, pressure at 4, and the pressure at 7. And the high pressure, 9, 11.5, pressure at 2, and the pressure at 3. So you get the pressures all right. 
And then you could take a look also at the temperatures. Um, uh, this one at 6, temperature at 6, and the temperature at 5 are both temperature at state 5 and 6 are negative 26. That, that was given in the problem statement, right? Negative 26 degrees C. And then the temperature at 7 and temperature at 4, 7 and 4 are negative 4. Now, once you go through additional pressure drop because you have to go down to pressure at 8 is equal to pressure 1, pressure at 6, that this temperature at 8 is negative 9.2. It's superheat. It's in the superheated region. So you mix something that's negative 9 degrees C with something that's negative 26 degrees C, and state 1 comes in at negative 16 degrees C. Make sense? The quality at state 4 is 28% quality. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then when you compress, you get the highest temperature at state 2. State 2, you have 55 degrees. We want to plot things on property diagrams. We want to plot them, especially on the temperature entropy diagram, also a pressure enthalpy diagram. Pressure enthalpy are real convenient for refrigeration applications. So you'll see a lot of pH diagrams when you deal with refrigeration. Why? Well, because you had the high pressure side and the low pressure side. So for this system, if I was to plot on a TS diagram, I'd first sketch a line of high pressure. That's a line of constant pressure, pH, high pressure, and a line of low pressure, PL. On a pressure enthalpy diagram, a line of constant pressure is really easy. pH, add PL. Right? Okay. So let's peg. State 1 is saturated vapor at the low pressure. So state 1 is right here, saturated vapor at the low pressure, and saturated vapor at the low pressure. It goes through a compressor, isentropic, so what is S2 compared to S1? The same. So on a TS diagram, it's really easy to show where 2S is or 2 is, right? Hmm. Down on a pH, this is the hard one. You have to kind of know where it goes. State 2 is in the superheated region at high pressure. It's going to be over here somewhere. And that's a line of constant S on a pH diagram. It's at pH and it's superheated. All right. Now, when you start to go into the condenser, the first bit of cooling just cools the superheated vapor and it'll lower the temperature of the superheated vapor. It's sensible cooling. The temperature will come down, down, down until it finally gets to this point. We don't have a different state for it, but what happens, it's now saturated vapor, and if I continue to cool it in the condenser, will the temperature drop? The temperature won't drop, but what will happen is, is I'll be changing phase so that it comes out saturated liquid state 3, out of the condenser. So the condenser has to first cool the superheated vapor so it becomes saturated vapor and then condense the vapor. All right. And so this is state three right there. Now when we go through the expansion valve, this is isenthalpic. H is constant, which is easy on a pH diagram. It's straight down now, straight down. So, but we still draw it as a dashed line because it's highly irreversible. It's constant H, but there you go. On a TS diagram, dashed line, increasing S to state 4. So you'll see this, the system sketched like this on a TS diagram, and the system sketched like this on a pH diagram pressure enthalpy diagram. Make sense? 
could you make a diagram for this problem? Could you make a temperature entropy diagram and a pressure entropy diagram for that problem? You can. It's a little bit of work, but let me show it to you. Since you had three pressures, put the three pressures on first. Do that right away on both of those. So this pressure was maybe a 911 kPa. This one was 253 kPa and around 102 kPa, right? And over here, 911... 253 and 102 kPa. Then try to fix some states. Now, often uh, you come out of the evaporator, that you can fix, or you come out of the condenser. When you come out of this evaporator, what was it? Saturated vapor, and out of here it's saturated vapor as well. Come out of the condenser, saturated liquid. You can't really put state one down first. You know, it'd be nice to go in order, but it's probably easiest to put state three down. So you put state three down right over here. And then you put down state seven and state six. True? Then that I didn't I did it do it down here, seven and then six. And then what do you do? Go through that expansion valve, so you drop to state 4, and you drop to state 4, and then you continue to 5 and to 5. So that's how you put states 4 and 5 on there. Then state 6 is already on the diagram. What about state 8 from 7? Coming this way? Well, 7 to 8 is irreversible. So S is going to be increased, and you have to jump to that lower pressure. So 8's out there somewhere. On a pH diagram, it's straight down from 7. All right, there it is. There's state 8. But when you join together 1, remember it's a, like a mass fraction average of the enthalpies. You can even calculate the temperature at 1. We already talked about that. The temperature at 1 was like negative 16. It was a mix of some fluid which was negative uh, at state 8, which was negative 9, and at state 6, which was negative 26. So you see the temperature of the mix at 1 is between 8 and 6. So 1 is between them, right there, between 8 and 6. So 1 is at the same pressure as 8 and 6, but it's in between on the temperature. Now you have state one, you can put it through the compressor. There's state two, and you just finished it. We're done. It's a little bit of work, but you're able to put fairly sophisticated processes or cycles on a TS and a pH diagram. Let's talk about selecting refrigerants. Um, how many refrigerants do you know of that are in common use today? What are their names or numbers? Okay, you'll see some CO2 as a refrigerant of choice, but it's growing in popularity. But nobody has a car with it in it, or nobody has it with a house or a refrigerator. So we have R22, and it's being phased out. 134A, R134A, which is the big replacement for R12, which has already been phased out. Refrigerant uh, 12 was in a lot of applications, and now it's gone, and nobody hardly knows about it anymore, and it's all been replaced by 134A as the kind of in commercial winner. You know, I didn't say it's the best. It's just whatever dominates the market. And uh, what else? Any other refrigerants? Ammonia, NH3. Yeah? Okay, I think that may be a, a, a version of 134. I don't. I haven't seen where that's used. Where have you seen that used? Oh, it's in development. Yeah, but if you ordered a brand new air conditioner installed at your house, what's the refrigerant that's going to be installed in year 2014 in your house? What, what's that refrigerant? Somebody knows it. I thought I 410, 410, right? 410A. I think it's 410A. 
Okay, it's basically doing a lot of replacement of the 22. It's replacing the 22, which used to be the mainstay in residential applications. Um, I think those are some of the big ones, okay? Well, how do you end up selecting which refrigerant to use? Well, the engineer selects it based on thermal performance, based on safety, and environmental impact. Why is this one history? Environmental impact. It was great for safety and great for performance. And why is this one going away? Environmental impact. Not because of safety and not because of performance. But there were, years ago, uh, the development of some synthetic refrigerants, essentially all of these are synthetic refrigerants, in the 1930s. And they were developed because the earlier refrigerants were very what you call toxic or flammable. So what happened? Would you like to be exposed to some toxic material? No, you would not. And so I thought I would try to show you this because it's easy to say, oh, yeah, we just had these refrigerants. But, you know, it was maybe a close to 90, 100 years ago that people were really struggling with this. So a newspaper article in uh, 1929, three killed by icebox gas. You know, some of these terms like we use air conditioning wasn't coined and readily used this, uh, at this time. But you can talk about the fumes, and what it's interesting is refrigerator gas blamed in the death in 1929. Here's the father, picture of the father, the mother, and the one-year-old baby. Something leaked out of the system. What leaked out? Methyl chloride. It was a refrigerant and toxic. Killed them. They weren't the only ones. There's a number of them. I have more of them, uh, but this one was even later. This is 1944. When was that other article? 29. All right. And uh, this one is what was happening in the United States in 44. The war. So in Chicago in 1944, February of 44, middle of the war or near the end of the war, two found dead. The couple here they are. The picture of them, husband and wife, uh, who was a you know 51 year old and 47 year old the methyl chloride gas leaking from the refrigerator in their 18th floor apartment, blah, blah, blah. You can see what happens here is they believe there was not enough tracer gas in the refrigerator to warn the couple of the dangers of escaping fumes. They knew this was deadly, and so they said you can still use it, but you have to put in a tracer gas which will stink such that when people smell it, they know they're in danger. What's in natural gas? If you have a leak in natural gas, you detect it from your nose. There was a calamity in the state of Texas, in the town of New London. I forget the year, but it was up by, um, it's in the, by the East Texas oil field. In the 20s or 30s, they didn't have the little odorant put into the natural gas pipeline. It leaked, nobody detected it. It leaked in the basement of a school, filled it up, exploded, 600 people were there, and about 300 died. It's a huge tragedy, which then followed. They started putting in some odorous material in your natural gas. And sometimes you could even tell. The company that puts it in, right, that supplies the natural gas, sometimes puts in an extra heavy dose, and then you can really even smell it through the little Fittings. I don't know if you've ever been exposed to it. It's like, wow, this really, no, it's not really leaking. It's just they really put a heavy dose in of that. So it, it appears that in the 1930s, they still used the methyl chloride as a refrigerant, but they were forced to uh, put in some odorant to detect, and they didn't have enough in there. So anyway, two methyl chloride deaths occurred in Chicago in 43. Two deaths, one city? Refrigeration leaks? Keep reading. Four other persons were overcome but recovered. The average has been about three deaths a year since 1929. You think we're going to put up with that? In 1928 and 29, there were 28 deaths from refrigerator gas. That's a lot of deaths in Chicago. 
The responsibility for inspecting, you can read more about this. I, I find it very interesting. It's poisonous. It's mixed with the tracer gas that gives an offensive order and causes eyes to smart. Sulfur dioxide, another refrigerant used at the time, not healthy, toxic, bad. But Freon, he didn't spell it right. Can you see the word? F-E-R-O-N? They didn't spell it right. It was a brand new word being coined, right? But uh, it's a non-poisonous refrigerant. It could leak out into somebody's house or apartment and not kill them. It has been taken off the civilian market because war industries used the nation's total supply. So Freon was out in the 30s, yet you still have deaths in 44 attributed to uh, toxic uh, refrigerant, methyl chloride. So anyway, it's, uh, yeah, they talk more about intoxicating drink and they don't know, really know what's wrong. They, they're sleepy. They'll act funny. They'll say funny things. They'll, they're like drunk. They call, called into work. I'm not feeling good. I'm going to stay home. He was all the time slowly succumbing in his apartment, in his house to this. So anyway, there's more you can read. But what I thought I wanted to do is not just say, oh, yeah, safety, sure, double thumbs up, looks good. Because sometimes in engineering, just like we have it right now, an Ebola thing going on, uh, you know, it's lives and people's lives. And engineers, not maybe involved in Ebola, but they'll, you'll be involved in something else that affects people's lives. So now we keep reading. So they developed this R12, which was highly stable. You could pound it in a piece of machine, heat it up, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down. It wouldn't break down, right? It's great. This refrigerant's great. And then this, uh, but the only problem was the CFCs had the uh, chlorine in it. And uh, all these uh, synthetic refrigerants used, they started out with uh, some chlorines. Then they found out that the uh, chlorine, when it gets up high altitudes, disassociates and then starts to combine with upper level ozone, eats holes in the ozone layer, more high UV light comes down and burns your skin and it's not good. So as uh, early as 87, the international agreement banned production of some of the heavily more chlorinated refrigerants, like refrigerant 12. And so they're developing new chlorine-free refrigerants, like the 134A, and this one's being phased out and being replaced by 410A. So here's just the molecular description of it, and you can see the fluorine, gives it that buoyancy, but it looks like a methane with a carbon surrounded by. So this would be the carbon here. And then, yeah, the hydrogen and then the chlorine. This is, looks like this is the chlorine right there. And then the two fluorines. All right. And so this one looks like a fluorine with three fluorines, a fluorine with three fluorines surrounding a carbon and a carbon, carbon and a carbon, and two hydrogens. All right. And yes, it's still being phased out. Uh, 2010 was a big year for phasing out. You couldn't, I don't think, manufacture equipment anymore and be sold. You could still service it. You could still sell R22 and put it in an existing machine, although the price per pound is way up. Um, you need to reclaim it when you take a piece of equipment out of service. But 2015, right around the corner, uh, they have goals for eliminating it. Um, further, and then 2020, even more, further goals for eliminating it. I don't know the status in Mexico. I really don't. Or other countries in the world. I don't know what China has for restrictions on this. I know that this was an international protocol, but I just don't know if uh, you go, you know, a couple miles away from here down south in Mexico and everything's still 12. I don't know. Does anybody know? I don't know. So... I just know the, the atmosphere blows across the United States and into the other countries pretty quickly. So it has to be an international effort. So when you look at some of these, you have get refrigerants, you have a ozone depleting potential, and they've been knocking a lot of those out of production, and a global warming potential. That's another environmental concern. And so they put the global warming potential relative to CO2 because Essentially, all these gases, unless you're good at reclaiming it, guess where it goes? At the end of the equipment's life? 
out into the environment. So a lot of this stuff, you know, even in the instructions, right? You're, you're to properly dispose of it. Well, I, I wish more of them read the instructions and properly disposed of it, but we know the reality is a lot of it does escape out. You do have leaks in refrigeration systems, and when it leaks, it, it's, it's leaks. So anyway, those are some of those things to think about, ozone depletion and global warming potential. Tell you what, I'm out of time. Thank you for your attention.